I'm going to open book of Acts chapter 9 and share a finish part of Towels and Titles series and the message titled What Should I Do? Book of Acts chapter 9 and verse 1. Then Saul, breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. He asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, meaning any who were Christians, they were called of the way at that time, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you Lord? And then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Verse 6, so he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. I want to focus today on these two questions that Paul asked when he encountered Jesus. Now I want to bring first a comparison between two Saul's. In the Old Testament there was a King Saul who was the first king that the nation of Israel had. He was good and then at one time he went bad. He started to chase his son-in-law David trying to kill him and one day in a similar story as this Saul went to Ramah to find David to kill him and on the way to Ramah God encountered him there. In fact he encountered him so powerfully that Saul laid on the floor naked and prophesied. So this Saul we read in the New Testament goes to Damascus to kill Christians and Jesus meets him and knocks him out of the horse. He doesn't prophesy he just goes blind. That Saul when he meets Jesus has a powerful encounter with God. He experiences the Spirit of God. He experiences the power, the fire of God. That's why he removed all of his clothes. He got right back up, felt bad for what he did and went back trying to not do bad. This Saul, he after meets Jesus, he gets up and he doesn't just feel bad, he repents. And when he repents, he doesn't just go back to his old life trying to not do bad, he goes back to do good. One Saul, he went into the history as an apostate. An apostate is somebody who turned his back on God. This Saul went into the history as an apostle. Somebody who gave us the New Testament, most of the New Testament. I want to tell you something this morning. Encountering God is so powerful. When you meet God, when you encounter God, when He meets you, it's so amazing. Some people meet God in their car. A song goes on to play and it touches them so much. Tears roll down their eyes and they realize God met them. Some people have a car accident and that's how they meet God. They wake up to the reality, life ends, eternity is real and something happens to their heart. Some people meet God when somebody gives them a prophetic word about them that they had no idea they knew and they didn't. It was God who said that word. And the reality that God is real touches them so much. Tears roll down their eyes and say, God is real, OMG. Some people meet God when their life is falling apart and a friend reaches out on Facebook or a friend from work messages them and says, could you come with me to church? They come to church and they haven't been in church for a very long time and the preacher happens to read their mail. And then there's a call for salvation and without them wanting to do it, the hand goes up, they go up to the front and they've never cried before, they cry and something happens, they meet God. Some people go to a life group and they are surrounded with love and they've never experienced that in their life and they meet God and God encounters them. It is so powerful. Your encounter with God will be probably different than mine. 
your neighbor's encounter with God will be different than yours. But I believe first of all there are people in this room today, it's not an accident that you are here, God wants to encounter you. Through the songs that you heard, through the testimony that you heard, your heart is softening up to God and God wants to encounter you. You might not fall from your horse, you might not lay naked, I hope not. You might not prophesy right away. You might not be like Paul and go blind. Your encounter with God might be a little bit different than someone else's. But one thing is certain is that God during an encounter becomes real. It's more than a sermon. It's more than a song. It's more than a beautiful atmosphere. It's more than emotionally induced environment. It's the reality of God that you come in contact with. You need to have an encounter with God. We create services as such. Our services are dynamic. We create them. We pray for them. We strategically approach them so that this can become a place where God can meet man. God sets an appointment and when you come, He can meet you. He can meet you. With that said, no matter how great your encounter with God is or how not emotional it is it does not change your life an encounter with God doesn't bring transformation it's an invitation to a transformation encounter alone doesn't change you because encounter it wakes you up but it's like an alarm but you still have a choice to go back to sleep. <laughs> we, we have this thing called snooze. And many people, when Monday hits, so is snooze hits. Sunday is the day where the Lord wakes him up. And the Monday is when the snooze hits and we just go back to sleep. We just go back to sleep. I want to share something today that I believe will give you a course to see change in your life. Both men had an encounter. One Saul had an encounter, he was the king and the other Saul had an encounter, he was a murderer. Yet one encounter led to the fact that nothing changed in that man's life and this encounter, meeting with God, led to something that not only his life changed, it changed the world as we know. They said the greatest, second greatest confirmation that Christianity is real after resurrection of Jesus is the conversion of Apostle Paul. It's the second greatest thing that made an impact on the Christianity that we know today is the conversion of this guy. It's not the encounter how powerful it was. It's that it was an invitation for something to change. And this invitation starts with two questions. When you meet God, you have to have two questions ready. It's interesting because these two questions are not the questions people have who don't meet God. When you don't meet God, your questions are, why is there evil? And why did somebody in my family die? Those two questions are real, they are genuine, and they're very important. But they're not the primary questions. Those two questions, why is there evil in this world? And why my loved one died are important until you meet God. When you meet God, these are not going to be the questions you will ask first. Nowhere in the Bible has somebody met God asked those two questions first. We all ask them until we see God face to face. When we see God face to face, the first question has to happen. If you had an encounter with God, if you recently got saved, baptized in the Holy Spirit, experienced visible healing in your body that you know it's true, God is real but you don't see change in your life, I want to invite you to that change today. It has to start with question number one. Who are you Lord? Who are you Lord? Please understand, Saul knew who Jesus was. Jesus was not a new guy on the block for Paul. Saul knew who Jesus was. In fact, knew so much to know he was a false messiah. Saul was not oblivious to the idea and the name and the person of Jesus. But when you encounter God, you always see God in a new light. 
You always see God in something new and this question Saul has is who are you God? Before you discover your purpose, you have to discover God's presence. Before you ask, what do you want me to do? You have to ask, who are you? Many young people today want to know what God wants them to do. God wants you to first know who He is. God wants you to first ask the question, who are you God? Not which, which degree I should get in college and not which person I should marry, which place I should live and where should I work and where should I go to school. The first question your Christian life has to start with is who are you Lord? And brush off the thing, well I know everything that is about Jesus. The more you think you know about Jesus, the less you actually know Him. You gotta know Him personally, not just about Him but personally. I met a girl in Tanzania, in the huts of Tanzania and she knew Barack Obama. She wore his hat, it said Obama. And I said, do you know who Mr. who the President Barack Obama is? She said, yes I do and she named his family and his daughters. I didn't even know the names of his daughters. She knew about Barack Obama but I can guarantee you one thing. If she would show up at the White House at that time, she will be arrested because Obama doesn't know her. See knowing about God is one thing. Knowing God intimately is where Paul was asking the question. He said, Jesus you just hit me off of my horse. I like the lightning. I like the show. I like what I feel. I like vibration. I like tears rolling down my eyes. I like that I feel something amazing. A weight is lifted but I know the feelings won't last me. I gotta know you. Who are you Lord? See many people they rely on the manifestation of God's power instead of revelation of God's person. When you know who Jesus is that will get you through life. That will get you through jail. That will get you through poverty. That will get you through sickness. That will get you through trial. That will get you through temptation. Who are you Lord? Who are you Lord? Who are you Lord? Before we ask what should I do, we have to ask who are you? If you are wanting to know your purpose today, if you're wanting to know why are you on this earth, don't start with that question my friend. Start with the question is who are you God? God hides your purpose in His presence. God hides your assignment in Him so that you seek Him and when you find Him, you find it. Sometimes God enjoys and plays hide and seek so that He finds the pleasure when we pursue Him. God only, not only rewards when we find Him, He rewards the very act of the pursuit. That's why it says that He's a rewarder of those who diligently, it doesn't say He's a rewarder of those who successfully find Him. God blesses if you seek. The Bible says blessed are those who hunger for righteousness. It doesn't say blessed only are those who are righteous. We know the righteous are blessed but God says if you just want to be righteous I'll bless you. The, the, David is called man after God's heart. The Bible doesn't say David had God's heart. He was just in pursuit of that and God says I like that enough to choose you. See God's presence seek God's love, seek His face because you must understand even if you don't think you have a purpose, even if you don't think you have an assignment, even if you think your life on earth is an accident, I want to tell you it is not but your assignment is not hidden in a university, it is not hidden in a degree, it is not hidden in the title, position or accolades or your skills or your gifts, it is hidden in God. His presence is the hiding place his presence is the hiding place for my purpose. Say this with me. Say, my purpose, my purpose is, hidden is hidden in His presence. And that's what Paul did. Paul didn't seek his apostleship. He sought Him, to know Him. And in that, he found something else. Who are you, Lord? And you would think the typical New Testament response would be, I am Jesus who died on a cross for you. For three days I suffered and I rose again. And Paul, look at these scars. 
I love you so much. He does not present himself to Paul or Saul as Jesus who loves Saul. That took, takes me off. That throws me off a little bit because I always tell people Jesus is the one that loves them. But in here he says, I am Jesus. You're currently hurting. That tells me Jesus is personal. That tells me Jesus can be injured. That tells me and Paul says, how am I hurting you? Like you're out there, I'm here. And Jesus says, you're persecuting my people. Therefore, you're hurting me. I find this thing with us who begin relationship with the Lord is we decapitate his head from his body in our view of intimacy with God. Let me explain. We kiss the face like Judas and call him friend and plunge the knife in the back of somebody's reputation, somebody's life in the church, betray trust, gossip about other people, abuse our spouses, hurt our children, talk trash about our parents while kissing Jesus on the cheek and think our relationship is always based with a kiss but where knife goes on the back of his back doesn't matter. And Jesus is telling Paul, he says, relationship with me is relationship with the body, not with my cheeks. See, we as charismatics, many times we love to spend time in his presence, meaning we love his face. We just hate his body. If you want to have a relationship with God, do not decapitate his head from his body. Do not separate his face from the rest of his body. That means the way you treat your wife is the way you're going to treat Jesus. The way you treat your kiddos, my father, listen father, is the way you're treating Jesus. The way you treat your spouse is the way you treat Jesus. You can't just have a devotional life and talk trash about other people. You are plunging a knife in his back while kissing his face. And Paul is saying, excuse me? Jesus is saying, I've made my people so dear to me. I actually made him part of me. People are a part. Jesus didn't make us into purses and toys. He made us into members of his body. Like right here he actually has, we are the members of his body and he is the head. That tells me the relationship I must have with the Lord is not just the relationship what I learned about Jesus and I relate to Jesus by praying, worshiping and reading the scriptures which is the kisses on his face. That is so wonderful. I had this problem when we got married. I know that raising my voice against my wife and raising my hand is completely, it's, it's wrong. It's, it's, it's bad. It's bad. But I, I found a loophole. When she would do something that brought me discomfort and like really, and I just wanted to like, like scream or manifest or, or do something and I knew it's wrong and I would hold myself. I did this thing where I would pinch, pinch her. I am very embarrassed to admit. I would pinch her and I would pinch her so hard that she would vocalize the very feelings I had inside of me. <laughs> I'm not giving any husband's ideas right now. No, no, no. And she would say this, ouch, you're hurting me. And I said, no, I'm just playing with you. She said, excuse me. He said, you're hurting me. But I love her. But at the same time, I was pinching her side. And as I was reading these verses, I felt that when I am pinching Jesus, yet spending time with Jesus, yet married to Jesus, but the way I treat people pinches him. And many of us would never do what Paul did. We will never persecute and kill other people, but we find a loophole. We like to pinch Jesus and some of your Jesus is screaming out of pain. And that's the Jesus we need to discover this morning. It's not just the Jesus that loves you. It's Jesus you're hurting. When you hurt other people, you pinch Jesus. And it doesn't matter how many kisses you lay on his cheek. 
and it doesn't matter how much of your makeup is left on his cheeks if you are on the side pinching him and stabbing him from the back by the way you relate to your people at your work to the way you relate to people at your work and the way you talk about other people the way you knowingly and willfully abuse other people i want to tell you something today is that your confession that you are saved and he is your savior is great he will smile back at you judas and say yes my friend why, why did you come but remember the relationship that's only based on kisses is very shallow we have many Judas's today who kiss Jesus publicly but stab him privately pinch him privately if you want to know your purpose you must understand that the presence of God is not only the face of God it's the body of God and the way I treat the body is the way I treat the face somebody say ouch. ouch after Paul asked that question <laughs> he did exactly the same thing as many of you I'm looking at your face right now like <laughs> and I see some spouse is going mm-hmm <laughs> go deeper so he trembling and astonished Lord what do I do when you discover that God's presence hides your purpose and when you discover that Jesus shouldn't be decapitated something begins to happen you are ready to find about your purpose what do I do and I love Jesus's answer I mean he's right there next to Paul all Jesus had to do is tell Paul you're gonna be an apostle uh, you're gonna go to jail you're gonna write a book da -da 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 -da. and you know what Jesus tells Paul he says Paul I want you to go to the city and you will be told what to do not only my purpose is hidden in God's presence but my purpose is also hidden in God's people God hides my calling in the community God puts my assignment in the gathering of his people he says to Paul this is one of the greatest Christians ever lived and Jesus doesn't tell him what he's gonna do he doesn't tell him what he's calling him to do he says I want you to go to the right place and in the right place you're gonna meet the right people and these people are gonna tell you what to do well Jesus are you, are you busy like are you in a hurry somewhere could you just tell me why are you here I mean why do you need to go tell them to go tell me let's cut the middleman <laughs> tell me straight up what, what do you want me to do what is the A B C what is the step one step two step three we're here right now I mean you knocked me out you got my attention I got it I'm not gonna kill Christians no more because that's hurting you I get it never do it again what do I do you're here Jesus are you in a hurry no, you're not in a hurry just tell me what I need to do and Jesus says go to Damascus and you will be told what to do if you take your notes write this down before God will tell you what to do he will tell you where to go God will always lead you to a right place before he brings to you right people he didn't tell Saul what to do he told him where to go when he went to the right place in the right place he eventually met the right people if you don't know the right people you need to find a right place instead of telling Saul what to do he tell them what to go God will guide us to the right place before he connects us with the right people we must understand is that not always God will tell you what to do at times what he will do is he will guide you to Damascus he will guide you to a local church he will guide you to a small group he will guide you to a group and a community of people that maybe you had interactions with before or see for Saul Damascus and the Christians are not necessarily his favorite five people on his phone Christians were the people he was killing and now he's not comfortable around them because he has to depend on them to know his assignment and he was actually destroying them see God will sometimes put you in the places you're like but I can't connect we don't click we have such a different interest I, they don't understand me I come from a different kind of world this is not the right God can I just spend time with you God says you can do that but if you want to know my purpose you need to go to the right place my friends not only God's presence holds your assignment but God moves your assignment into the right place and that right place first is the church where you go to a church I know some of you here today you're like but I've been burned by the church 
I've also had baristas make back, make bad coffee. I didn't give up on coffee and I didn't give up on coffee shops. I also had a lot of disappointments in Walmart, in Target, Marshalls and TJ Maxx and in every place but if I need to get a piece of clothing I still would go to those places. I want to tell you something today that devil will use your past hurts and disappointments and he will say listen toxic people hurt you. Let's give you another hurt is isolation. Isolation is as bad as toxic people because in isolation you hurt you. With toxic people, toxic people hurt you. And so I want to tell you today that before you find your purpose, you're going to have to find a right place. But sometimes the right place doesn't feel right. It doesn't have to feel right to be right. Damascus didn't feel right for Paul. You know what felt right? Jerusalem. Damascus was uncomfortable a little bit because these were the people he, caught, he sought to kill. But God says, I want you to come to the right place. Ruth found a right man on the right field. See some of you ladies, some of you young men, you are looking for the right person in the wrong place. You're not gonna find a right person in the club because club is the wrong place. Right people hang out in right places. Wrong people hang out in wrong places and many of us we find wrong people in the wrong places and then we come to God and you say, God give me a right person while I'll kick it in the club. Give me, send me the Mr. Holy and Mr. Righteous person. Send me a man that will love me. Which, but you're looking for a man who drinks. He loves alcohol, not you. Now, that's your choice? Don't blame God. God can give you a right person if you're at the wrong field. Ruth, if you want to find your Boaz, you need to go to a right field. If you want to find a purpose, if you want to find a right person, you got to be at the right place. Before God gives you a purpose, He gives you a right place. You're like, well, so what? I'm at the right place. But I still haven't met the right person. I still haven't met somebody who can mentor me. I still haven't met somebody who can unlock my destiny. I still haven't met somebody who can connect me. I love this about Saul. He's at the right place and he's blind. At the right place, and he can see anything at the right place and for the first time in his life he has no idea what's happening to him three days blind and God comes to Ananias and said Ananias go to that right place and see Saul and I love what this what it says in the Bible it says that he is praying when you're at the right place have not met the right people pray at the right place but don't know what to do next don't know which college to go to don't know should you go on a date with that person don't know if you should marry that person don't know if you should buy a house build a house don't know if you should go to the medical school or if you should go to a teacher's school don't know if you should go to a Christian college or internship when you are at the right place but you are in, in, in the dark God didn't leave you he wants to see you pray because there's Ananias he's talking to right now but he wants to give a reference that you're praying. Pray. That means Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, 5 in the morning, 6 in the morning, 7 in the morning, 8 in the morning, whatever your time is. If you are in the dark but you're in the right place, you're like, man, I know God's supposed to have me at Hungry Gen but I don't know what to do next. Pray. Saul is praying great destiny ahead of him horrible past behind him completely oblivious to what he should do next but he is praying when you don't know what to do talk to God when you don't know what to do get on your knees and say God I seek you I don't know what the next step has to do I don't know where to go God but you are my light and my salvation you are my way you are my truth and you are my life I will be praying I will be praying I will be I will be seeking the face of God. Somebody shall pray. Pray. Touch your neighbor and say, you got to pray more. You got to pray more. If you don't know what to do, pray. You know how to pray, pray. The Bible says, behold, Saul is praying. Behold, Saul is praying. God will lead you to a right place before he leads you to right people. If you are at the right place but you haven't met right people, 
pray. I remember something happened with, with me and Lana. I met Lana and then the next day I broke up with her. And uh, <laughs> I had a problem with my head. And so I, I, I truly did. I had such an indecisiveness. I wasn't sure, was this the one? Is this not the one? And it was the New Year's of 2009. And our church two days later goes into 21 day prayer and fasting. I was confused. I was, in, I was in the dark. I did not know what do I do next? Do I pursue? What, what is wrong with me? Why do I start relationships and it ends and I just, I get cold feet and I get so indecisive and I quit and so, but when I was in the dark, we were praying and after about, you know, 17 days of, of fasting, you know, something happens when you pray. God will send you Ananias. When you are in the dark right now, but you're in the right place, start praying. Ananias will come and for me just the clarity came in just the understanding came in and then I reached out to her you know and then four months later we were engaged and then we were married and so I, I could testify from, from from my life is that your purpose is tied to the right place but before the right people come to the right place there's that gap where you need to pray and I'm not talking about that prayer on the way to work while you're doing makeup I'm not talking about that to your favorite Caleb song I'm talking about you set some time to pray I'm talking about you set quality time to pray. I'm talking about you give your attention. Now while you're scrolling the Instagram, you say, well, I'm praying for all my feeds. No, 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 no. Your feeds don't need that prayer. You need prayer right now. You're praying. You set some quality time. You put your heart into that prayer. You, no, no, no. Not under your sheets. That's not praying, my friend. That is laying. <laughs> you need to get out of your sheets and, and get on your knees. Get before the Lord. Do something where your blood is flowing. You're awake. You need to be praying. And then the right person comes but I want you to see when it comes to our purpose when Ananias came in when Ananias came he does something to Paul Ananias the right person covered Paul's basics basics what does it mean he came in he right away removed his darkness by giving him vision and then he prayed for him to be baptized in the Holy Spirit so Saul started to be filled with the Holy Spirit then he right away baptized him in water and then the Bible says later on that Saul received food so he gave him food and then right away the next day he took Saul not to a Bible school he took him to evangelize right away so Ananias in your life are those people God will send into your life they will not help you to be an apostle they help you to be a Christian God didn't send someone to help Paul to write New Testament. He first sends right people to help him cover his basics. Even if your destiny is to be the next Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Billy Graham, Richard Bonke, Catherine Kuhlman, even if your destiny is to be the next creator of an app that will change the world, God will send right people not to help with your destiny but first to help with your foundation. And what is your foundation filled with? That you live with vision. Meaning that you see your tomorrow better than your yesterday. Secondly, God will help you with your basics or those people will help you with your basics. What is the second thing? That you speak in tongues, that you know the Holy Spirit. And that you get water baptized. Before you write the New Testament, before you go saving people and changing the continents, you need to go to that pool and get water baptized. And then what needs to happen is you need to receive food. One day you'll write food but now you need to receive some. One day you'll preach sermons that other people will make movies about but right now you need some food for yourself. You gotta cover your basics. Somebody say basics. See basics they lay your foundation and then not only that but you gotta start sharing your faith. You say but but I need to go to college first. Bible calls you to be a witness. A witness doesn't go to college to be a witness. A witness has an experience and they then open their mouth. It's good to go to college. It's good to go to internship. But you don't need that to be a witness. All you need to have a test, to have a witness is to have a testimony. Jesus encounters you, he touched you and you begin to testify. And you need to do that ASAP. If you get saved today, that means afternoon during lunch, you already need to start evangelizing. Not tomorrow, not next two months, not after two years. I see how this church Jesus thing is and then I'll see. The Bible says Paul the next day and that's confused people because everybody's like, what? We saw this guy. This guy's like, what? And that's, that's what you want to evangelize when it confuses people. When your co-worker's like, dude, really? Are you on drugs or something? 
Why are you so happy? Why are you talking about Jesus? Man, you're not like that. That's what is you found religion? It's like, no, 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 I lost religion, found Jesus. In fact, you found me. Your basics, Ananias will come into your life in the form of a small group leader in the form, form of a leader in the church, a brother in Christ and they will help you to cover your basics. Some of you here today, there's a destiny that is inside of you. You're in the right place. Some of you here today, this is the right place that you're supposed to be in. You have prayed long enough and the Lord has sent Ananias into your life. Is there, is there a life group booklet that we received on the way today? And so I want to tell you something right now is that and the amazing part is the hungry gen gives you so many Ananiases. You can choose whatever one you like. So Paul only had one. You have about 23 or 24. You just choose whichever Ananias and I'm going to tell you about these Ananiases. They're believers like you and I but they will help you to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They will help you to get back to get into the Bible. They will help you to sign you up for water baptism and they will help you to start reading the scriptures and give you practical advice on how to share your faith with your friends. That's the basics. Somebody say basics. Touch your neighbor say get your foundation. That's your foundation. And the Bible says after that and I'm, I'm finishing it says when Paul got baptized he started to preach. After some time the scripture says that disciples after many days have passed Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul and they watched the gates of the city day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down through the wall in the large basket. I want you to see this. The right place, no right people, pray. You get the right people, the first right people they come to help you cover your basics. They don't come to help you become an apostle, a worship leader. They come to help you make sure you're a good Christian. And the right people, they cover your basics. But there's something else. The right people also, they cover your blind spots. Paul was about to be killed before he opened the churches and conquered the world by the Jews. And it was disciples who made a basket. And during the night, these people were not apostles and prophets and teachers. They were regular church folk who loved Jesus, cared enough for Paul not to let him be killed by his first problem and they covered his blind spots and during the night dropped him and therefore they protected his life. The right people they not only cover your basics they also cover your blind spots. We all got blind spots. I don't care how anointed you are you got a blind spot. Paul had a blind spot. I have a blind spot. There were people that were out to kill him. There are demons that are out to kill me and there are demons that are out to kill you and that's why you need to be in a community. You need to be in a small group. That's why you need to be surrounded by other people who can cover your blind spots. Who can bring you down in a basket if you need to. Who can drag you to church if you need to. Who can get to your house when you cannot come to church and pray with you. Who can counsel you when you fell back into your sin. Cover your spots. Who can protect you from that Jezebel you're about to marry. Who can protect you from the crazy guy you're about to marry. Who can cover your blind spots. Somebody say Lord Jesus help me. But he can help us if we allow people to cover our blind spots. Before I turned 20 there was like five people that I wanted to marry. Not all at once. <laughs> one after another. And one of the people that I had in my life is my pastor. And unlike the teenagers that do it today where you know they they hook up they get the girl pregnant then they come to their parents and say, hey we want to marry and so I, I would go to my pastor if I had a crush I mean I'm talking about I had like an infatuation they didn't even tell my friends yet I had an infatuation and I would come to my pastor and I remember a few times where he was already asleep and I came to him and I'm, and I'm shaking because I'm scared to tell him that I have a crush and I'm like 16 and a half and so and I didn't know it would pass you know and so I would come and, and I would tell him say you know I, 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 I and he's like what's wrong with you He's like, is everything okay? Uh, I'm like, yes. Did you fall into porn? No. Did you, are you on drugs? No. He says, why are you here? Why is it 11 o'clock and you're here? I, I liked it, this, this girl. He said, no, that's not from God. Move on. He says, that's why you came. He says, leave. You're, you're good now. No, it's not from God. And I said, you didn't even hear about all the signs and prophetic words I got about this person. I look back today and God bless all of those precious ladies. But I am so glad. I am so glad that at the age of 17, my pastor dropped me in the basket from the wall of my infatuations. 
I would have splashed my brains and my head if I would have fallen from that wall. See God will send disciples, mentors in your life to cover your blind spots and you gotta be willing to submit to their ropes and to their speed as they bring you down instead of saying I'm an apostle. Nobody gonna tell me what to do. You gotta kick that out. There's gonna be nothing of apostleship left if you don't cover your blind spots. Somebody say amen. You, you need the right people before they unlock your destiny they will protect from your personal problems. I'm not saying we should let people rule our life but we should let people help us to get closer to Jesus and if they see something to say something like they say in the airport and that we will listen so that we will be protected. Lastly and I believe this is a prophetic word for somebody in this room. This is a word that I believe so strongly about when Paul had Ananias, he helped him with his foundation. He had disciples. They helped him get protected from the death threats that he had. And then Paul comes to Jerusalem. And if you read in chapter 9, it says that when he came to Jerusalem, all disciples were so scared of him. In verse 27, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and how he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus. See what you're doing right now that you consider is not helping you to get your destiny. It will be one day part of somebody saying that on your behalf to people you dream to meet. Come on now. He told the apostles, he says the Lord met him. He's seen the Lord and he's preached boldly in Damascus. Nobody saw that. It's, there's no videos about it. It's not on YouTube. It's, nobody took photos of it. But he preached boldly in Damascus. And how he had preached boldly in Damascus in, in the name of Jesus. And verse 28, and he was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out. I want you to see the process. Here is an apostle. But God doesn't lead him to apostles until he leads him to cover the basics, come on, come on. cover the blind spots and then God supernaturally gives you a Barnabas. Amen. Who is a Barnabas? He's your connection yeah. to high places. He's your connection to apostles. You may say well, well, apostles is it only so I can take your photos with apostles? No, no, no. It's because you have a calling of an apostle and God will place put you in the place of people who are doing what one day you will do. But the problem is those people don't want to hang out with you because they're busy. So God will send you a Barnabas who will bring you to them, who will tell them of you have that destiny, what God has done in your life. And those people will open the door and say, now you're part of our clique. Now you're part of our circle. Now you're part of our community. Let us teach you how to preach. Let us teach you how to prophesy. Let us teach you how to go out and go in. Paul, let us teach you how to activate that gift. Activate that anointing. Activate that calling upon your life. Hallelujah. I believe somebody's Barnabas is coming. I believe God is releasing a Barnabas in your life who will connect you to your destiny. He will connect you to the dreams you had at 12. Dreams you had at 16. Visions you had at 21. God will send you a Barnabas. A Barnabas. See when Joseph was in prison, little did he know is that butler was his Barnabas. Yes, it looked like he abandoned him. But then when the butler went to Pharaoh, butler made the connection between Joseph and his destiny. God will use the butler. God will use a Barnabas. God will use the, the Peter to connect Cornelius to his calling. God will use somebody. There's about one church in Florida. I went there a long time ago and I saw three schools in that church. And I started to have a dream. One day we will have internships. It will be different but I saw what's possible and what's going to be capable in our city next year. The exactly same thing that I was exposed in. It's, it's a large influential church but because somebody opened the door for me to be in that church I was exposed to something I didn't even know was inside here. And today we are seeing that. Same thing happened with Missouri. There's a church, the Connect Church, amazing church doing great things and one time I remember I preached in that city for another church. And I felt that I need to go to the church. It's, it's a, led by a Russian pastor, but it's predominantly an American church. 
and I remember when I went there and I saw you know three services I was like man one day we're gonna see similar things where 20 30 people getting saved little did I know eventually I went and I preached in the church and a lot of things including growth track and some of the things that we actually even copied from that church why because God will place you in the circles of things that you got inside of you it's things that you got inside of you even today after the second service you know I'm gonna fly in to to have a, a dinner with Pastor Benny and it's not because I'm looking for a photo shoot I don't care about that it's because you know not only because I was invited but because I know deep inside that there is crusades and there is ministry that God has for us that will be international I'm talking about Brazil, Argentina, I'm talking about Africa, I'm talking about China, I'm talking about Korea, I'm talking about Europe. I believe that God will take this ministry and it's not a coincidence that David Diga, you know, without even me asking for it, he created that connection and let me sit in that circle where I can be like a fly on the wall and learn and watch and see, oh wow, that's how they do it. Why? Because I know that what God has deposited in us, we need a right environment to cultivate what God has placed inside of us. And I speak that over your life. What God has promised you, He will connect you to a right environment. He will connect you to a right community. He will connect you to the right people. People you dream of meeting one day, God will send you a Barnabas. God will send you a Barnabas. And that Barnabas, he will open the door. And why do you need to meet with the apostles? Because you're called to be one. Why are you going to need to meet with them? Not so that you can take a photo and post it on Instagram. Oh, I met this great person. It's because one day you lead a company just like that one. Because one day you will have the same impact in your sphere of influence as that person has. Why? Because one day you will make the same difference as that person has. It may seem impossible, but Paul, just wait. Because what God has promised, He is faithful to do. What God has deposited, He is faithful to pull out of you. That's why He's placing you with the Apostles because there is something inside of you Mary that is kicking when you meet Elizabeth. Something is inside of you Mary is leaping when you meet Elizabeth. Somebody give God some praise right now. I believe in destiny over your life. I believe in the calling of God upon this church. I believe in the calling of God upon our worship. I believe in the calling of God upon our pastors, our preachers and our evangelists. Somebody give God some praise right now.